So uh, last time we uh, quickly went through this example of a sledge setting off and we talked about uh, static and uh, kinetic or dynamic friction. Um, and when there's a difference between them, you end up with a sort of sudden jerk when you set off uh, because the friction force suddenly lowers and so you go from zero acceleration and to a sudden uh, finite value. And this is why you get a, a sudden sort of start when pulling something. So we'll start, in fact, with a, a, uh, a question. So we've got a young boy now pulling the lead of his dog who is lying on the ground. The dog remains at rest. So if the weight of the dog is W and the coefficient of static friction is mu between the dog and the ground, and the boy is pulling horizontally on the lead with a force T, the question is, which of the following statements must be true, right? So not necessarily which one of the following statements might be true, which of the following statements must be true. The tension is less than or equal to mu times w. Tension is less than mu w equals mu w greater than or greater than or equal to. So vote. Okay, so we have a few of you went, well, most of you went for, for A, and a few went for B, and then small numbers for the other ones. Okay, good. So you did not, you did not fall into the trap which this question was trying to, to, to get you to do. So the correct answer is, uh, if this works, the correct answer is indeed A, all right? So why, oops, not that, <sighs> wrong button, there we go, yeah, there's always one who gets in there, right? <laughs> Wait for the pen to boot, okay, so what we've got going on here, got it up there, good. So what we've got going on here is, so here's our ground, our dog I will model as a block. And so we want to draw the forces that are acting on the dog. Well, we've got the weight of the dog acting down, and then we have the normal force between the dog and the ground that acts up and counteracts the weight. And then we have the uh, boy who is pulling here with a tension T on the lead horizontally. So, and then the last force we have, because obviously this would not balance because we've only got one force acting horizontally, we've got to have a friction force, and the friction force is going to oppose the relative motion of the dog versus the ground. And so if the tension is pulling this way, we're going to have the friction force pulling that way, right, to counteract the tension. So we're told the dog remains at rest, so what we can do is we can do Newton's second law vertically, and we'll take that as positive, and then we have R minus W equals zero because the acceleration is zero. So we have the normal force is equal to the weight, and then we can also do Newton's second law horizontally, and then we get T minus the friction force is equal to zero, which means that the tension must equal the friction force. So now we want to relate this uh, friction force to our reaction force here. Um, so the rule for the friction force, and this is the, this is the bit that I was wanting to, to test you on, is that the friction force must be less than or equal to the coefficient of friction times the reaction force. So, and a lot of the questions that you do, and, and so this is what the trap that some people fall into, a lot of the time in questions, we always talk about the limiting case of friction. So you'll be asked, you know, if the child pulls and the dog is just about to start sliding across the floor, right, what would be the force of friction or what would be the tension that the child will be pulling with, right? So a lot of the questions that you will be dealing with deal with the limiting case of friction, and that's when this frictional force is at its maximum value, and when it's at its maximum value, 
f is equal to mu times r. And that's, in fact, why you are usually asked about limiting cases, because it gets rid of this inequality, which makes things hard, right? However, all you know, if all you know is that it's at rest, then the child might not be pulling on the lead with enough force to generate the maximum possible friction. And so the frictional force here always balances, right? This always holds true. This frictional force does not just go to its maximum value, because if it did, the dog would start sliding away from the child, right? Which would be pretty weird. Um, so it's less than or equal to, and so when we combine these together, since r is equal to uh, uh, w, then we have the frictional force is less than or equal to mu times the weight. All right? Any questions? Good. Okay, so the next thing we're going to deal with in terms of forces is tension in strings. And this sometimes causes people uh, 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 a bit of trouble. Um, so the first thing that sometimes confuses people, it shouldn't in this course because we are not going to deal with pressure, but I know it can sometimes confuse people when you get into the, uh, um, into the second course, is that pressure and tension are not related. Now, I know, you know people will say it's only related in medicine because you know, if you're under a lot of pressure, you can get a tension headache or, or vice versa, right? But they are not related in physics. Right? So I know, you know sometimes conceptually people think the two are related. Uh, this only applies to medicine, not to physics. Right? So when you deal with pressure uh, uh, next, uh, next term in, in physics 146, uh, um, don't, don't get the two confused. They're completely separate things. Um, so the simplest case here of tension in a string is we just have a mass here hanging at the end of a light, inextensible string. So that is physics code word uh, for light, meaning the string has no mass, and inextensible, meaning it doesn't matter how hard you pull on it, it is not going to stretch. Right? We will deal later with uh, Hooke's law and, uh, and elastic strings, um, but this is a light, inextensible string, which means it has no mass and it cannot be uh, extended. Right? So, this force here, if you imagine you've got a weight, when well, in fact you can look at the weights there, they're hanging on the ends of strings. Um, so in this case, you've got a fixed string, it exerts a tension upwards here on the mass, and clearly in this case, if the mass is remaining at rest, then this tension must equal the weight uh, of the mass, and so you've got T equals mg, just by resolving forces vertically and putting the acceleration to zero. Right? Now, the thing is with tension is that so this string here is under a tension, which means that anything attached to either end will feel this tension pulling it in. So under Newton's third law, if we've got an action here pulling down on the string, there is an equal and opposite reaction where the string exerts the same tension now pulling down on its support uh, on, the, on the ceiling. Right? So if you've got a string under tension, it will exert that inwards force Along, at all points along the string. Now, of course, here in the middle of the string, it's, you've got a straight piece of string, and so the two forces at any one point here cancel each other out, right? You're still trying to sort of pull every part of the string uh, apart, but since the force is going to be equal, the tension is equal all the way along here, the forces cancel out everywhere. It's only at the end where you've got this last bit of string that has a tension pulling it down, but there's no piece of string on the other side to cancel that force. And so you end up with just a net force acting down here. And here at this end, you end up with a net force acting up. All right? So the place where it gets a little tricky is when you start introducing a pulley. So now, if we loop this string over a pulley, this tension acts all the way around the string. Right? So now, because we've curved the string here, right, each little element of the string here, you've got the forces pulling on either direction. But because the string is curved, the two forces do not line up precisely. And so you have a small resultant force. Right? So I will attempt to draw that here. So if you imagine, so if we take first of all our straight piece of string and we take a little bit of it, right, and we say we've got a tension T uh, on the string. So if I look at this little element of the string here, I have a tension 
pulling it down here, that's T, and I have a tension that's pulling it up, that's T, and so the two forces are going to cancel out, and my net force here is equal to zero. But it's important to remember that these forces are acting on every little element of the string. And the reason they have to be zero here is because this string has no mass. So if the forces do not add to give zero, then you've got an infinite acceleration for this little bit of string, right, which would be bad news. So if you put it over a pulley, then now what you have is you have a curved piece of string, and you have a part of a pulley here. So and so if we look at this little piece of string here, We've got a tension, I'll exaggerate sort of the angular difference between the tensions, right? You've got a tension here, and you've got a tension here, and so there is a net force that acts this way on, on that little element of the string. Now, of course, we can't have a net force acting on the string, but the reason that the string is bent is because it's pushing on the pulley. So what actually happens is you also have a force, a, a uh, normal force between this piece of the string and the pulley that is pushing that way, that exactly cancels the sum of the two tensions, right? So if we've got a, a normal force that's pushing this way to cancel this resultant tension force, then Newton's third law tells us that on the pulley, we have a net force acting from that little element of string that's pushing on the pulley. And if you imagine this, you've got this force coming from all points around the edge of the pulley. And if you add all these forces up, right, what's happening here right? If we add all these forces up, we have a tension T in the string. So if you imagine we're wandering along this, this string here, and we start, we're, we're going to be turning this force. So if you take this piece of end of the string and sort of imagine you're going around, then you're taking a force that at this point in the string is acting, is pulling it up, and you're turning it through 180 degrees, right? So if you sum up, I'm not going to do the, the calculus here, right? But I'm just trying to explain where this number comes from. So if you sum up all the changes in the tension as you go around the top of this pulley, what you will find is that you, your, the net sum is you've changed a force vector that's initially pulling this way, and you've turned it through 180 degrees. And so therefore, the change in force caused by this normal force between the string and the pulley so the sum of all the normal forces acting on the pulley is going to be two times the tension because you've converted the tension at this end of the string from T upwards to T downwards, which is a change of 2T. Right? So that's why when you loop a string over a pulley, you end up with a net force on the pulley of 2T acting downwards. Right? So if you think about it, so that, that's sort of the, uh, um, well, a little bit of a hand-wavy explanation as to why you end up with this force on the pulley. But if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because if I was to, I'm not going to, but I mean, if I pulled really hard on this pulley, you could imagine that by pulling on these strings, I could yank this pulley off the stand, right? So clearly, when I pull on these two pieces, on these two strings, I am exerting a force downwards on this pulley, and if I exert a large enough force downwards on the pulley, I can break it, right? So, and the force that's acting downwards on the pulley is twice the tension in the string, because, I mean, the other way you can think about it is I've got a tension pulling down here, and I've got a tension pulling down on that side. But the reason the force gets exerted is because at each point around here, I've got a normal force acting in, and it converts an upward-going tension at this point as I wrap it round to a downward-going tension there. So the net change in the force is twice the tension, right? Or the other way, to so just think I've got two strings hanging down either side of the pulley, and that exerts a force of 2T downwards. So is everybody happy with that, or are there any questions? Because that's usually the bit that causes a bit of uh, confusion. Good, okay. So, 
Here now we've got a slightly more complicated system. We have a, a string hanging over a pulley and a mass on the end, uh, but the tension again is still equal to the weight because we've just got one tension acting upwards on the mass. But this is the nice thing with pulleys, is that we don't just have to have, um, we don't just have to have one pulley, we can add a system with multiple pulleys. And in fact, in, in the case of these pulleys, we can actually wrap the string around it multiple times, like the example there. So the first thing to note is that most of the time when we're talking with these pulleys, these are going to be ideal pulleys, which means that, again, they are massless and there is no friction involved. Right? Sometimes, there, there may be one or two times when we actually do deal with a, a pulley with a mass or a, or a frictional force, um, but in most of the cases, that's not going to be where well, we're going to be dealing with these ideal pulleys. So in this case now, we've got a, a, a string that's wrapped um, and it's, it's got to be fixed to this pulley somewhere, and it's wrapped around this pulley um, and around a bottom pulley here. And so now if you look at the pulley at the bottom, we've got a net upwards force of two times the tension pulling this upwards because we have two strings you know, attached to the pulley, or well, one string, but it's wrapped around it, so you get twice the tension. And so what that means is, is that now my f tension in this string here only has to be equal to half the weight, right? I can have a, 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 a tension now that's half the weight, which means that if I can pull, if I'm wanting to lift something, you know, instead of, if I can exert a force of, uh, I don't know, 500 newtons, then um, I can double that by means of a pulley system and lift a weight of 1,000 newtons, even though I can only pull with 500 newtons. And if I do it multiple times, each time I loop this string around here, I add another factor of two to how hard, I, you know, how much upwards force I can generate with the pulley system. And so this is why, for example, in old sailing ships, um, these things were known as blocks, uh, and, and this here was the tackle. Uh, but you'd use blocks and tackle um, because that would essentially magnify the strength of the, uh, of the sailors, and so you could lift far heavier sails um, uh, up to great heights in the rigging um, by multiplying the strength uh, of the sailors using a, a simple pulley system uh, like this. Of course, they were far from ideal pulleys because they didn't actually rotate. They were just a block of wood with a hole in it. Um, so there was lots of friction, and they clearly had a mass. Um, but you know, this is how you can actually magnify uh, uh, the force that you apply. And so here's an example. What we've got here is a 200-gram weight uh, attached to a 50-gram weight here. And the system is, as you can see, looped around several times. So it's actually giving us uh, about a factor of six. Um, but of course, we've got a rather thick string. And so these are not ideal. Uh, it's not an ideal pulley system. So at this point, because of the friction, it's actually balancing. But if I put on a little bit of extra weight, oops, until it falls off, um, you can see that a tiny mass here can generate enough force to lift a, a mass that's four times larger than it simply by using uh, a pulley system. Now, the other thing to note when I was doing that, I'll slide it in there and then it should stay, right, is how far, notice how far this mass falls and how far this mass rises. Right? This fell pretty much all the way down here, and this mass just rose a small distance here, and that's the price you pay. Right? As we'll see when we get to conservation of, uh, of energy, uh, you can't get something for nothing. So although you've magnified the force, if you've doubled the force, you have to move this weight uh, twice as far to lift this. Uh, you have to move this weight, this force, twice as far as the weight that you're lifting will move. Or in this case, in fact, you have to, this weight drops six times further than the distance that this weight uh, 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 rises. So there is a price to pay in terms of how far you have to pull the rope, but you can magnify the force. And in fact, any system like this, so this is just one example of a system, uh, we'll deal with another system with levers uh, after the midterm. Any system like this that magnifies force, the price you always pay is you have to move the force that you're applying through a larger distance than the uh, force you get coming out the other end.
Okay, so we've actually mentioned this concept a couple of times without explicitly saying it, um, but equilibrium is a state a system can be in when there is no net external force acting on the system, and what that means is that there is no acceleration, right? Newton's first law, no net external force, no acceleration. So any system that has no external forces, uh, no net external force acting on it is a system that is in equilibrium. Now, note this does not necessarily mean that the system is at rest. It means that there is no acceleration. It is possible to have a moving system that is in equilibrium simply because the system is not accelerating, right? So it does not mean that it has to be at rest. And there are two types of equilibrium that we consider. There are what we call stable equilibrium and unstable equilibrium. So an example of stable equilibrium is if I put this pointer here and I push it and I displace it from equilibrium, it remains in an equilibrium situation, right? It does not, if it's resting like this, it doesn't matter if I, if I tap it slightly from, from its current equilibrium position, it still remains in equilibrium, or in fact, uh, you know, forces act to restore it to equilibrium. So it's not quite a good example of uh, equilibrium. Probably a better example would be if you had a little ball bearing at the bottom of a, of a, of a U-shaped uh, track, and you displace the ball bearing a slight uh, distance away from the equilibrium position at the bottom, the forces then acting on the ball bearing would restore it back to equilibrium, right? They would move it back towards the equilibrium position, and so that's what's called a stable equilibrium. If you give it a little push away from equilibrium, it does not you know, go catastrophically away from equilibrium. So an example of an unstable equilibrium would be, if I can manage it, to balance this like that, and now that's in equilibrium, it's not accelerating, but if I give it a small tap, it falls away from equilibrium, right? And it finds a different equilibrium position. So that is an example of an unstable equilibrium where if you disturb it from the equilibrium position, it falls away from it. So another example would be if you had a ball on the top of a hill and you pushed it away from equilibrium, it would of course then run down the hill uh, and would end up somewhere else. And so that would be an example of unstable equilibrium. Okay, so here's one to consider. We've got a parachute jumper falling through the air with a parachute out behind them and they're falling at a constant velocity which is called the terminal velocity. Uh, although not as terminal as if they didn't have a parachute. Um, and so the question is, is, is this stable equilibrium? Is it unstable equilibrium? Is it not equilibrium at all? Or is there not enough information uh, to know whether it's uh, uh, stable, unstable, or, or not in equilibrium? Got you thinking? Okay. So we have a 50-50 split between A and B. So uh, the vast majority of you think it's equilibrium, but you can't decide what type. So uh, turn to your neighbor and try and convince them that you got the right answer. OK, so let's uh, vote, vote again, see if anybody's changed their minds. Come on. There we go. OK, so we've got a, a slight reweighting, but they're still pretty balanced. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the answer and then explain why it's the, the right answer. So the correct answer is... Come on. A, right? It is a stable equilibrium situation. Now, there's two ways we can argue this. There's the physics way, which I'll go through in a minute, and then there's the, uh, the fact that people will actually strap a parachute on their back and jump out of a plane, right? If it was an unstable equilibrium situation, what that would mean is, is that if you disturbed it from equilibrium, so for example, say a bird flew into the U and, and you know, you've suddenly got a temporary increase of mass that pushed you down a little bit faster, if it was an unstable equilibrium, that would mean you would move further away from the equilibrium. So if you sped up a little bit, 
uh, that would mean that suddenly you'd start to increase your speed rapidly and, and leave a small crater in the ground as you, as you plowed into it, and nobody would take up parachuting, right? Um, because it would be, you know, you get hit by a bird and, and that's it, you're dead, right? Of course, the, the reverse of that would be is that if for some reason you got slowed down by something, say an updraft or something like that, you would then move away from the equilibrium position and start either accelerating upwards or come to a stop which is uh, equally bizarre, right? So, uh, so that's, the, that's the sort of the, uh, the, the hand-wavy example. But uh, now, now we'll do the, uh, the, the physics reasoning. OK, so what we have is we have our, our person here. Um, and I'll show off my amazing artistic skills. Um, So we have our parachutist, right? And the parachutist has two forces acting on him. He has his weight acting down, and he has this, uh, we'll call it a frictional force. It's due to air resistance acting up. And so we're told, first of all, that it's a constant velocity. So I think everybody got that F is equal to mg. And so therefore, of course, it is an equilibrium um, situation, right? We are in equilibrium. So what happens now is if you want to decide whether it's stable or unstable, what happens now if we perturb the system from equilibrium? So say, for example, a, a, a bird flies into the, uh, uh, into the guy temporarily and gives him a, a, a small increase in, in his weight and then it flies off again, so it causes him to uh, accelerate a little bit faster. It perturbs him from his equilibrium situation, so he's moving down uh, a little bit faster than his uh, terminal velocity, right? So this is a constant velocity v, and so for some reason, that terminal, that velocity that he's moving at increases by a little bit. Now, if he increases his velocity, nothing will happen to his weight, right? It's weight, constant gravitational field, his mass is the same, and so therefore, no, no change in his weight. So this force remains the same. But if you move faster through air, you're going to get a bigger air resistance force. And so F will increase. So in this case, if, if you, uh, uh, V increases by a small amount, that will mean that F will increase. And that means now that F will be greater than mg. And so you will end up with a net force upwards. And that will mean that V decreases, and it will go back to its equilibrium position. Right? You'll slow down because the friction force increases. The exact same thing will happen if you decrease the velocity for some reason. If so, for some reason, there's an updraft or whatever, and he slows down uh, uh, a little bit, then what will happen then is F will decrease, so F will be less than mg, so the net force will be downwards, and his velocity will increase again. So this is an example of a stable equilibrium situation, because if you perturb it from the equilibrium, you end up back at the equilibrium situation. The net forces act to restore um, equilibrium. Yeah. Oh, that was just shorthand for equilibrium. Equals BM. Sorry, my shorthand. OK, so how about this? So we're on the Earth, and the Earth's orbiting the Sun. So is the Earth in stable equilibrium, unstable equilibrium, not in equilibrium, or there isn't enough information to determine whether the Earth's in equilibrium or, or not? OK, so I can tell from the conversations we've already reached the discussion phase, which is the reason why is because we're all over the place here. OK, so do turn to your neighbor and try and convince them that you've got the right answer. OK, let's uh, vote again and see if anybody's changed their minds. OK, so let's see what we've got. Wow. <laughs> so we're still all over the place. Okay, so I'll give you some hints about how to think about the, the system, right? 
So what we're talking about is we're talking about the Earth, right? So the first thing you have to decide is, is the Earth in equilibrium? And so for that decision, you have to decide then, you know, if there is a net force acting on the Earth, and in other words, is the Earth accelerating in any direction? Right, because that's, remember, our definition for equilibrium. If there's an acceleration involved, that means there's a net force. That means you're not in equilibrium. So that's your first thing you ought to think about before you even think about whether it's stable or unstable equilibrium. You've got to decide, first of all, is it equilibrium? Right? Then the next thing is, is if you decide it's equilibrium, you then have to decide is it stable or unstable. Now, again, right, you can think about this in the common sense sort of way. Right? If you decided that the Earth is in equilibrium, and I'm not saying that that's the right answer, but if you have decided that it's in equilibrium, if you perturbed it from equilibrium, does it end up moving back to where it was originally, or does it end up in some sort of death spiral in towards the sun, or, or getting shot off into outer space, right? Because that's literally your two options. If it's in unstable equilibrium and you perturb it away, then it's not going to go back to where it was. It's going to go you know, way out of its way one way or the other, right? So have a think about that. So first of all, equilibrium, not equilibrium. If you decide equilibrium, then you've got to decide stable or, or unstable. So I'll give you la last chance to vote, and then... Uh... <laughs> ah, okay. So, the right answer. We had, finally have a favorite has, has appeared. Okay, the right answer is indeed C, right? So it is not in equilibrium. We are not in equilibrium here. It's a stable system. Obviously, it's a stable system because it's been like this for about 5 billion years, um, and you don't get that with a bit of, without a bit of stability, but it's not in equilibrium. And the way you know this is simply because if we have the sun here and the earth out here, we are moving in, uh, well, okay, I'll highly exaggerated in this drawing, elliptical orbit. We are not moving in a straight line. And since we're not moving in a straight line, that means that our velocity vector here is changing. So we have, uh, so V changes, which implies that the, there must be some rate of change. You know, dv by dt is not equal to zero because the velocity vector is changing. So you've got to have some rate of change of velocity with respect to time. And of course, that is just our acceleration. So acceleration is not zero. And so that means not, and then I'll, I'll write it out longhand. Oops. Right, so we're not in equilibrium. And so that was the trick to that question is you don't even have to decide whether it's stable or not. Because if it's not equilibrium, it doesn't matter, right? It, it's a non-equilibrium system. It's stable, but it's not equilibrium. OK, so supposing we have three non-zero forces acting on, a, on an object, right? So this is a more abstract question. One points due north, one points due south, one points due east. Is this body in equilibrium? Right? So yes, no, or I haven't actually given you enough information to figure that out. Okay, let's see what we've got. Bingo, excellent. Okay, so uh, we don't need to have the discussion thing because uh, a large number of you got it right. So the correct answer is, when the system lets me pick it, um, the correct answer is indeed B. Um, and again, this is actually quite easy to explain. If we have our object sitting here, and we have a force that acts north, and a force that acts south, and a force that acts east, and we're told that the forces are non-zero, then we could imagine here that it might be possible that these two forces balance out, 
or maybe not, we don't actually have enough information to determine whether the object is in equilibrium uh, in this sort of north-south direction because we don't know whether the forces can cancel out, whether the forces are going to cancel out or not without knowing their magnitude. So that would sort of suggest that we, we haven't got enough information. But if we look in the east-west direction here, this force is non-zero. There is nothing on the other side to cancel it out. So we know for a fact that there is a net force in the east-west direction. And so therefore, we know that this is not an equilibrium uh, situation, right? It's not equilibrium because we have to have a net force in the east-west direction. OK, so this is a tricky one, right? So if we have a block of wood subject to the forces shown, is this one in equilibrium? Yes, no, or it's impossible to say. OK, so uh, I mean, we won't go into the discussion phase for this one because this was just a, a, a way of uh, making you think about things and introducing uh, a topic we'll be covering later in the course. Uh, the correct answer here is actually no. Because when we were talking about equilibrium and saying whether the net forces add to give zero, that is one of the conditions for equilibrium, but it's not the only condition for equilibrium. And when you have a rigid body like this, you also have to have the forces like this. They are, uh, although there'll be no net acceleration in any direction, a linear acceleration, what will clearly happen if you imagine you've got the ruler and you push up one end of it and pull down the other is it will start to spin round. And so as it starts to spin, this part of the ruler will be accelerating upwards. This part of the ruler will be accelerating downwards. And so there is an acceleration involved. It's an angular acceleration, and so it's not actually in equilibrium because the mo motion will start, right? It, there will be an acceleration. So, uh, but we'll deal with this in, uh, later on in the course uh, after the midterm or around the midterm when we do rotational motion. Okay, so when we're involving forces, anytime you're doing a question that uses forces, what you need to draw uh, in order to help you solve the problem is what we call a free body diagram. And this free body diagram has to contain all the forces that act on an object, right? So not only do you want to put all the forces that are going to be acting on an object, you also want to put where they act on the object. Now, at this point in the course, it doesn't matter so much where they act, right? Because we're doing linear motion and you're just going to be adding all the forces together. But as we saw in that last example, if you have the forces acting at, say, opposite ends of a rod, then it does matter that they act at opposite ends because that will generate rotational motion. So you should get in the, in, in the habit now of not just act, writing the forces on the object, but write where they act on the object as well, because that will be important later on in the course. The other thing is be very careful when drawing the diagram to make sure that you have included all the forces. If you miss one off, you will get a wrong answer. If you add an extra one that isn't there, you will also get a wrong answer. Um, and two of the typical misconceptions are adding a centripetal force as some extra force that sort of comes from nowhere, or, or what other times you have is if you have an acceleration, people will add a, a sort of a kinetic force um, that is the force causing the acceleration. Things like kinetic force and centripetal force are labels for forces that already exist. So you, know, you cannot just add, a, if you know something's accelerating there in a particular direction, yes, you know there's a force acting in that direction, but it's got to be caused by something. The same thing with a centripetal force. If something's going round in a circle, you know there's a force acting towards the center, but it's got to be caused by something. You can't just magically add a force there and call it the centripetal force, right? You have to know what's causing that force. So we'll have time for one last quicker, quicker question. So we've got here a block resting on a slope at rest. So you're told it's at rest and there's a friction force uh, between the block and the slope. So which of these five diagrams is the best force diagram, right? Not necessarily the only correct one, but given the rules I mentioned on the other slide, which one is the best of the force diagrams? <laughs> 
Okay, so we got a split. So I will tell you the answer is B, and I will explain why that's the best one next time. <laughs> so I'll see you all on Monday.